Hello everyone, I'm Kevin, otherwise known as Foreign BX257, here to bring you another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review, and today I'll be continuing on with my highly requested vehicle playset, the 1987 Defiant Space Vehicle Launch Complex. Now, if you haven't seen parts one or two of this video series, I highly urge you to watch those first, because I will be referencing both of them in this review. But today, as part three and final, I'll be taking a look at the booster space station and the crawler launch gantry driver hardtop. First, we'll take a look at hardtop. Now, like payload, hardtop is a very hard figure to find on the aftermarket, especially with all its accessories. Just the figure alone is kind of uncommon, far more uncommon finding him than it would be for payload for some strange reason. But it's also very hard to find this figure with his accessories. And one reason for that is, sometimes this figure was not packaged with his pistol. So you can find some people selling this figure on the aftermarket without the pistol and still calling it complete. Which is not an entire untruth, I suppose. But you will only get your uh, the full dollar value on the aftermarket for this figure when he has his pistol, which is unique to him. As a matter of fact, because he's often missing the pistol, I found that some sellers, whether knowingly or unknowingly, give him the 1987 Psych Outs pistol, which I'll admit is fairly close in looks. And also kind of easy to understand why they might give him Psych Outs pistol, simply because it's from the same year as well. But uh, Hardtop's pistol is definitely, definitely unique with that big beaver tail and hammer. Of course, it's always difficult to find an action figure with his microphone still attached. And this one drives Hardtop's value up to crazy prices. It's just pegged in there. One thing I'll note about the um, plastic quality of this is it's kind of uh, springy. And the white plastic is almost see-through. It kind of reminds me of um, the 1989 Stalker's um, gun and accessories. I don't know if it's the padding in his belly, but I've actually found this figure to be a bit chunky, <laughs> especially in the torso. Nothing wrong with a bit of chunk, though. I will have to say, though, that at one point I thought this figure was a simple uh, recolor of the 1984 pool booth figure. With his hard hat, rolled up sleeves, and a uh, kind of lazily slouching belt there. I think that even if you don't have the crawler, like me, I think that he would make a really good CB or construction battalion, a sort of a worker engineer in the background of maybe a, an Air Force base or a naval base. Just like I do sometimes with toll booth, I sometimes use him as a, a army or marine worker in the background. And finally, we have the last component of the Defiant Space Launch Complex, the booster rocket space station. This uh, rather large piece is 26 inches long and about 13 inches wide. Just to give you an idea, here's a size comparison with the Sky Striker. And as you can see, the, the nose doesn't quite come up to the uh, where the nose on the booster rocket is. 
The width, however, is about the same, though. Of course, you all want to see what this looks like with the space shuttle on it, of course. And here it is. With the Defiant attached. With the shuttle attached, the booster rocket's canopy doesn't open all the way up. Unlike the shuttle, this canopy has a simpler hinge and it opens just all the way up like that. Inside the booster's cockpit, you can see four highly detailed seats and there are ten foot pegs on the floor. There's actually an 11th one right here on the edge, but I think that's mainly meant for the uh, figure that sits on this particular seat. As the other three seats actually have these, uh, these consoles just sort of cupping the, the uh, seats and keeping the figures actually in fairly well. The arrangement kind of reminds me of like a Star Trek um, starship bridge. I don't know if that's what they were going for, but I kind of wish they hadn't. Because, just like Captain Kirk's seat, it's slightly raised. And that means that the central figure, his head is right behind the main hinge here. And there's really no angle that that looks good at. Oh, and the foot peg? No, the figure's foot would always be on an angle if sitting properly in the seat, so you can't use that foot peg. And it's also too close to the edge of this thing in order for a figure to stand up properly here. So I don't know what that 11th foot peg is for. You'll notice that there's a square hole in the back there. And that'll come into play when the booster is in its space station mode. On either side of the front of the booster are these laser cannons with a tiny little black missile underneath it. Now. These are supposed to move around, but these are also the most fragile parts of the booster. And I'm kind of afraid of cracking this thing right off. As a matter of fact, I have a separate piece right here, just to show you. And as you can see, this thing is on a ball joint. So it could move around all sorts of places, as well as swivel around. But I highly would not recommend doing that, because the socket on the actual booster itself is so tight that this thing is this thing normally just cracks right off right at the um that little piece between the actual cannon and the ball joint underneath we have the attached missile which is actually rather distinct because of this knob at the end moving around to the side we have a removable panel which shows some internal parts detail as well as an umbilical cord hole. And you can just put your MMU on there and it fits just fine. And behind that, to the very rear of the craft, we have a hidden panel. Now this is something that I kind of wish that they had done with the front because those cannons just sticking out at the front they kind of um they kind of ruin the aesthetic the very uh, streamlined aesthetic of the booster rocket and yet here we have these panels which you just pop in and twirl around <laughs> you do have to sort of uh, uh position these things a little out of the way twirl them all the way around and they just click into place straight and now you have another set of lasers with the little rocket underneath here and these um, these sockets are a little bit uh, a little bit looser a little bit too loose but I think I'd rather prefer them to be far far looser than having them stuck and just crack right off rotating this again then you have the back end with the thruster panel and again, these are just uh, the sort of friction in 
thruster nozzles. The large ones are, again, interchangeable with the shuttle, but these uh, medium-sized ones are not. Continuing on to the other side, we have the same type of uh, hidden panel with the little cannon and missile inside. Just hides up again. Taking a look here, we have on this side two removable panels. A small one and a somewhat medium-sized one. And that's actually it for the outside of the space station booster. Unless you count the door on that's on top of here. Yeah, as you can see, the bottom side of the booster is very plain. Not even landing gear. In order to transform the booster rocket into its space station mode, it's actually rather simple. You just have to lift up this one wall into position. One thing you might want to do before you do that, however, is to remove this one door panel. You don't have to, but it's actually kind of nice to do that, and you'll see why later on. On the back end, there is this raised piece here, and you can use that as a finger grip. And you just lift this up, and then lower it down into place. Now if you raise the wall up and left the door on, now you can see inside the cockpit that the little square hole has now filled up with the exact size of the door. But if you had taken it off beforehand, now you have an action figure sized doorway from the cockpit to the inside of the space station. With the wall raised, the playset is now 15 inches high. And here we have the ground floor of the space station. There's the opening doorway, which connects to the cockpit. And here we have a transporter module. Yeah, that's right. That's what the instructions call it. Just like a molecular beam transporter from the world of Star Trek. This thing has a sliding glass door. And you can put a figure in there and then you just cover it right up and pretend to beam your figure down to some alien world. It doesn't actually do anything other than just this though. On either side you'll see that there are little stations here with uh, swiveling chairs. The chairs are fairly uh, fairly easy to break right off the shaft here because unfortunately this part of the wall actually comes down so you actually have to put these chairs specifically um, this way and out of the way when the wall comes down Going down along the side, we have even more uh, technical detail. It would have been nice if we had some uh, stickers for the monitors here, but oh well. And now we have another chair, a very unusual chair too. Right now this seat is in its storage position. Again, if you put the wall back down to make this a booster, the seat would be in its way if it were out. 
and it just folds out like that. However, this seat actually does something else other than just that. Now, as you can see, it has a little monitor and a little keyboard underneath that. And this entire station actually kind of slides upwards. If you just push it up like that, it slides up on a curve. And I believe they actually did that just to give you a sense of um, zero gravity within the uh, within the space station. And that's what it looks like with a figure in it. He's almost sideways in relation to the rest of the craft. And if you want to move him back down, I would suggest actually pushing down on the monitor or something else other than trying to grasp the chair itself because the chair has these two little uh, nubs which act as the lever which kind of uh, pushes it back into its uh, upright spot. And those two nubs which allow the chair to do, to do that are actually fairly fragile and will break if you try and if you kind of stress them too much. And this is just the other side. The details are actually different. And you'll notice a massive amount of uh, foot pegs all over the what is a pretty much a very plain floor. But of course it has to be plain because the wall actually comes straight down on top of that. There are 40 foot pegs in all. From the main floor, there's a little ladder going up straight to the second level, the crew quarters. The crew quarters has only really two things going for it. These things, which are supposed to be sleeping beds, because, of course, you know, in zero gravity, you can sleep upright or in any direction. And this thing over here, which is a locker, both of which seem pretty practical and actually kind of interesting to play with, or at least display. Unfortunately, nope, the back pegs are just too shallow on this thing. So, what's wrong with this locker? Well, there's nothing particularly wrong with it. It's kind of shallow, unfortunately. But the thing is that you can't fully close it because this tab is just too big. If you fully close it, this thing is just so hard to open up again. I just have to leave it just open like this. You'll notice that there are foot pegs on here, so it's not a completely useless thing. You could just use this as like a storage bay or something like that. There's seven foot pegs. But interestingly enough, there are seven foot pegs on the bottom as well. And again, that's a really nice touch to give yourself a sort of a, a zero gravity feel. So you just locate one of those foot pegs on the bottom, put your figure on there, and all of a sudden you're floating in space. There are only six foot pegs on the top of here, but again, that's a great display feature. And again, going up the ladder, we can access the third and final room, the EVA Center this extravehicular activity area also has seven foot pegs for all your figures as well as some interesting storage space on top which the instructions encourage you to put your helmets in but of course you can put anything in there unfortunately they don't close up or anything and this is where the MMU backpack is normally stored Unfortunately, this sort of gets in the way of the airlock door. You can have one or the other, but it seems like you can't use both. Uh, just put the helmet on the figure. And now you can put the figure on the inside of the airlock. 
Now this is one area which I wish it did have a foot peg, but it kind of doesn't. <laughs> Once you have the figure in there, well, good enough, then you can revolve the door around. And now we're at the very top of the space station. We can just slide this airlock hatch open. And now the figure is open to space. On the top we also have yet another umbilical cord for the MMU. So that too can be plugged in. With the airlock hatch open, now we can dock the space shuttle to the space station. You just have to line up this circular part with the open square hole. And it just rests on top. And there's the space hatch connected to the space station's airlock. And now you can do cute little things like this. Just like the crawler and the shuttle, the booster has Easter eggs sculpted into the surface detail. But these are from an unusual source, a 1979 MPC model kit of the Millennium Falcon. And now it's time for... Does a modern figure fit in it? As usual, I'll be using my 2009 Rise of Cobra Footloose figure as my example. But keep in mind that vintage foot pegs and back pegs are already not compatible with modern day figures. Yes. 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 Sort of. Sort of. And no. Connecting, and I use that term loosely, the shuttle to the space station docking wall is the scariest thing I've done with my G.I. Joes bar none. The shuttle doesn't lock onto the top of the wall. It's designed to just rest there using a shallow rectangle indent. It totally relies on you putting the shuttle on straight on the top of the space station wall which is, by the way, angled slightly at the top. Never mind the wall itself wobbling around if you have the booster on an uneven surface. This is pretty unfortunate since the whole space shuttle docking feature is cool, and the airlocks lining up gives interactivity the two didn't have when connected as just a booster. That aside, the booster, with its Star Trek Starship-like bridge and extra MMU backpack umbilical cord plug hole, means you can play and display it alone, despite it being essentially a big rectangular lump of plastic otherwise. In space station mode, it's a displayer's paradise, with open areas, seating consoles, different levels, a ladder in between them, and my favorite, foot pegs that simulate zero gravity by being upside down. Such a simple thing, but it's very gratifying to look at. I've already gone over the design faults with the MMU backpack storage being in the way of the airlock door, the beds, and the locker door. But one design I wish they had considered was a way to keep the shuttle attached to the booster while in an upright position. I didn't talk about this in my shuttle review, but both toys can rest upright on their thruster nozzles. They're quite stable standing like this, but when connected, they have to be on an angle. The crawler's launch gantry is on a slight angle after all. Otherwise, the weight of the shuttle tips over the booster, but then I guess that would make the crawler redundant. Easily one of my funniest Easter egg discoveries on a G.I. Joe toy was finding Millennium Falcon parts. But here's how it started. The tapered square detail reminded me of something I'd seen recently. Given the amount of G.I. Joe used parts on the crawler, I thought that was it. But no, 
It wasn't until I thought about the round vents at the very back of the engine, looking like the Millennium Falcon's vents, I went, no, it couldn't be. Had the sculptor designer pulled another Cobra Sea Ray Macross Valkyrie prank again? So I checked out a Kenner Millennium Falcon. No luck, the vents were stickers, but I knew I was on the right track now. The tapered squares were right above the Millennium Falcon's entry ramp. What other Millennium Falcon was from that era? The model kit. So when looking for vintage model kit parts, I found the vents, I found the tapered squares, and I found other matches I wasn't even looking for. Thank goodness there's an umbilical cord plug on the booster space station. If the engines don't start, you really can get out and push. <laughs> that's, a, that's a little Star Wars humor. <laughs> uh, never mind. Well, that's all the time I have right now. Please check out my Facebook page for more information and behind the scenes photos for these reviews. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for next time to see another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. See you then.